Welcome to the Supply Chain Pioneers Podcast, where we highlight industry leaders on the forefront of innovation and technology in planning, procurement, and logistics. Hosted by your supply chain pro to know, Ulf Venn. Supply Chain Pioneers is powered by EverStream Analytics. EverStream gives you the predictive insights and analytics to make your supply chain faster, smarter, safer, and leaner. Go to everstream.ai to book your demo today. Hello, everybody, and welcome to a new episode of Supply Chain Pioneers. And with me today, I have Michael Hood, who's a university professor at the University of Fulda for Applied Science. And with that, I want to welcome you, Michael. Hello. Michael, as always, before we really get into the matter, it would be cool if you could introduce yourself a little bit. All right, Ulf. Thanks very much for the introduction. Yes, I'm Michael, and that's probably easier than Michael. We just skip the surname. That's also easier. I'm a professor, as Ulf said, of logistics and supply chain management at Fulda University of Applied Sciences. I've been doing this job for now 18 years, quite a long time. When I studied, when I finished my A-levels, I went to the army for two years. Then I studied business. I worked as a scientific researcher, had my own consulting company. I was also an adjunct lecturer. And then sooner or later, I had to start at the university. That's my yeah. CV in brief. Perfect. And now we want to go through a couple of things, including research, but also how you actually started in supply chain management, which is my first question. So how did that actually start? Well, Ulf, uh, can you promise that no current or former students of this, of mine, watch this video? I don't okay. know. Okay. <laughs> I actually failed in an exam. I was supposed to become a tax consultant because my father was a tax consultant. My ex-brother-in-law is a tax consultant. So that was some kind of obvious to become a tax consultant. And so I studied business and uh, I was in an exam where I didn't go to the lecture before and I failed. So I had to go to that exam again or to the lecture again. And at these huge universities, every semester, this course is taught by another professor. So that professor was quite interesting. And I thought, okay, what is he teaching in the majors and it was logistics, which was something I didn't know anything about at that time, but he was a good guy. He was very interesting. So then I went to his lectures as a major, and this is actually how I started to become yeah, a logistician. And I come from a family where we have a lot of doctors. So everybody thought I'm also going to study that I didn't why probably my grades, I don't know if that was a factor, but yeah, I didn't. And I just slipped into supply chain management, which is a little bit of a different story because I didn't have this inspiring professor, but I can relate to sometimes failing something or not being good at something is an opportunity to do something great and else. Okay, perfect. I would like to talk a little bit about how you stay up to date because obviously you have started in research, then you did a little bit of consulting yourself, you then went into teaching, but whenever I talk to you, you're quite operationally savvy and you know what's happening within companies. So for me, how do you, it's important to understand, how do you keep in touch with the real world? Mm. Yeah, that's a good question because the danger is when you're at the university, you're teaching, you're doing research, you have a lot of things to do. There might be a gap between reality and the life at the university. On the other hand, for us at a University of Applied Sciences, it's crucial to be in contact with companies to see what's going on, what are requirements, what are trends in supply chain management or in the companies uh, in general. When I started my career at Fulda, I actually wrote a letter to 50 companies. At that time, it wasn't an email, it was a physical letter. And I wrote, I'm the new guy at Fulda University. I'm responsible for logistics. If you're interested in, well, collaborating in some ways, if you're just interested in what are we doing, what can we offer, just call me or send me an email. And there were many companies who invited me or came around for a coffee. And that was the start being in touch with the companies around Fulda. And that way I also started some kind of round table in Fulda with companies in that area. We have established that probably 10 years ago, and we have 
we're probably 50 or 60 managers in logistics and supply chain management. Another thing is that we have a lot of final thesis, a bachelor thesis, master thesis that are not research related, but that are that tackle questions in companies. So that way I stay also in, with, in contact with companies. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. And actually, perfect segue for me for my next question, because we now talked about your students and you're teaching a lot of different students and it's a big part of your day-to-day -day life. So looking at my podcast, most people I interviewed have started by coincidentally somehow slipping into supply chain management, right? It's not that the, anybody prepared and make, made a conscious choice to study that. So Now you are educating the next generation of professional and trained supply chain employees. What do you think they will bring to the table that currently may not be there? Or maybe it's not like that, but just what will they bring to the table that will help future supply chains grow in maturity? That's a good question, because this is a question I always think about when I get to know the next generation of students. And... We have different programs. One program is a little bit like you said, there's some kind of, it's a broad business study program. So logistics and supply chain management is just a, a small part. Many of these students come directly from school, so they don't really have the idea what to do. They might have heard about that marketing is quite cool or interesting. Uh, they have heard about tax consultancy that it's it gives you a lot of money or you can you you will never get unemployed, and they often have not heard about logistics and supply chain management. So, in this study program, I try to inspire them that supply chain management is something very cool and it has a huge impact on every day's life actually. But we also have two study programs that focus on logistics and SCM. One is a bachelor, it's a dual program, it's called logistics management. So people who attend this uh, program have already applied at companies, went through an assessment center and so on. So they have a at least a first idea that they want to work in logistics and supply chain management. And then we have a master program supply chain management and those students really have a goal. They, uh, some of them come directly from the bachelor program, but some of them also have worked for some years between bachelor and master, and they know what they want, and they want to work in supply chain management and want to apply methods, models into their everyday life, working life. So they have a clear idea, and that's really cool. It's also challenging, actually. I like that because, you know, when students come from a company, they have certain uh, tasks, certain challenges, and then they want to have solutions and approaches. This is challenging, but it's also, it's good. So you already touched on some of the reasons students want to actually start studying supply chain management. And are there any others maybe still? And also... Something I'm very curious about is a dropout rate, right? How many people are actually finishing this? Because supply chain is, I would say, a very taxing job, right? It, it can be stressful. So I'm just wondering if people understand that while studying and maybe might leave for something else to then find out this is probably also stressful because it's work. Yeah, that's right. Actually, the dropout rate from the, the two specific programs are very low. It might be in the bachelor program because the students are already been selected by the companies. So there are top students and they, of course, have a contract with the company. It's quite a tough, tough study program, having six or seven semesters, working three months, being at university for three months. So not when you think about student life, then you think about, yeah, the summer break and the winter break. It's You have a lot of time. They do not have that much time, but they do not struggle. They're, they're a small group. It's normally around 30 students. So the dropout rate is, I don't know, very small. And the same is true for the supply chain management master program. I guess it's because it's also a small group, 25 students normally, and they have quite a good team spirit. So if one is struggling, the others might try to help him or her And there, the dropout rate is a little bit higher, but not really high. Okay, interesting. Mm -hmm. You touched on some of the reasons, right? For example, you have to inspire them to get there. 
others are coming from the job and then the master students might just for, uh, want to further their career. Are there any outliers like cases where you thought that's a very interesting journey that this person did to get here, essentially, to the master studio, master program? Very often, it's interesting if people from other countries, they have quite a challenge to come here, especially when they're not from within the European Union. Now I have a student or I will have a student from October on from Iran. I will have a student from India. And one question is the question of getting a visa to be here on time and then start. But it's also the question of, will I be able to cope with the challenges in the study program? And we had a lot of talks before the, she actually enrolled, or both of them enrolled. And even we had some students talking to them. So it's very good if you see that one is really interested and it's so motivated, but maybe is not fully sure if to cope or not. Then some talks be before, like here now, via Teams or phone or email will help. And that's great when they're there and they really enjoy it. I had one student, let me just tell that, from Colombia. And I got to know her in advance and she was so mot motivated. She came here, I, I met her and she was she went through the study program in such a great way. Now she lives in Hamburg. She has a great job in supply chain management and I'm really happy that this worked. Well, that's actually a cool story. And yeah, it, it's great that people have such a passion for the topic that they actually travel all over the world and leave family behind. It's, it's impressive. Okay, so now we want to go from a very inspiring and impressive story to one that is unfortunately a little bit sadder. And I, I thought we have to talk about this. So a few years ago, there was a very dramatic shift in your life. Would you maybe share that story with us? Yes, I can do that. I was at that time in South Africa at a partner university. I was, I had planned to stay there for five months until Christmas and From the beginning on, I realized something was not right with my body. I used to run longer runs, 10K, 15K, half marathon. And there I started, I arrived three days later, I ran on the camper, on campus. After 3K, I was just almost dying. And I thought something is not right. I waited, I continued, but over the time, nothing improved. So then I went from doctor to doctor. And one doctor said, Michael, for a white person, you look far too white. Let's have a blood, let's take a blood sample. And they took a blood sample. And then he called me and he said, come into my office tomorrow morning. And I came to this office and he actually diagnosed me with leukemia and said, we actually have to have you here, keep you here. We should start treatment right now. And that was actually, that was a shock. And I had, didn't have anything to do with leukemia, but I remembered when I was a child and my parents talked about this topic, meant at that time, it, it's a long time ago, that meant people would not survive. I know about this already. And that's why I asked that question, because you have been quite open in the communication of your treatment and you have always have had very a very positive spin on the whole topic, which I personally found to be super inspiring. What was your motivation to openly share your journey through the leukemia recovery process? At that time, it, right from the beginning, I didn't know if I would make it or not. That's just not possible to say. And even I asked the doctors, my doctors two months ago, and they said, no, you cannot tell it in advance. So for me, Since I work as you, Ulf, in resilience, I thought, okay, now this is a, a the best example of being resilient, hopefully. And then I thought, I have such a, a big network, and if I'm just not there, there would be some rumors. So why not be open? Why not be frank and tell people about the situation? Maybe with a smile on the face, because... I need that. I need that smile. And that was incredible, actually. Super inspiring. I think you also saw a lot of positive feedback, which is great. And I, I personally just appreciated the whole journey. So yeah, it was yeah very brave, but also good. I really loved that everybody was so behind you. It's, it was just amazing. Yeah, I just interrupted. Yeah. Sorry for that. But that was also a push for me. I saw you. I saw colleagues. I saw former students. I 
saw friends and they all pushed me and, and sent me some messages. And just a like somewhere or a thumbs up really helped me. Because if you're in the hospital, you don't know really what is going on. You get a lot of chemo treatment you're not feeling great at that moment, then all these mini pushes and messages, they really help help you to be, yeah, to stay strong. Yeah. And that you, you needed to be because, <laughs> yeah, yeah it, it was definitely wasn't easy. <laughs> oh. Okay, but now you're recovered, right? As we can see, except for you have broken one of your tooth today, which is unfortunate. Oh, yes. But you are back in full swing now, and you are also doing a lot of field research again, right? You reach out to companies, and you recently finished writing a, a new study around supply chains and the resili resiliency around supply chain for a German procurement organization called BME. It's not yet released, but maybe you can already share some yeah. of the findings with us as a preview. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you know that because you're, you work in resilience. We did some comparison between the situation before and after, before COVID and the blockage of the Suez Channel and the beginning of the war in Ukraine. And we compared the situation before with the situation now. Before, companies perceived their own resilience as very low. Only 21% of the companies thought they had a good or a high resilience in their supply chains. Now, almost four years later, it's the, the percentage has doubled. So 44% say we are more or less resilient. Also, the, the importance of that concept of being resilient has increased dramatically. However, what we see is that the large companies, they're miles ahead and the small and medium enterprises, they struggle a little bit. And if you now think about a supply chain, a long supply chain, that doesn't normally consist only of large companies. So if one of those small companies are is involved and then has a problem or is not resilient, that means the whole supply chain is not resilient. So that's actually a challenge uh, for the small and medium enterprises. And that's a finding that we can prove with the data we have so far. Very interesting. A lot of small companies are involved and they're not at the same level. I can attest to that. In fact, uh, a lot of them are still on a stage where they just manage financial risks. But uh, yeah, 2008 was 16 years ago. So a lot of people have moved on and their the supply chain risk is now a little bit bigger than it was before, geopolitics, whatever. So it's, yeah, there's definitely some catching up to do. Oh, I'm looking forward to this study. But I, another thing that I feel is if, no matter if they're resilient or not, just feeling resilient and being confident about it can already be good, I think, right? So you, if you think you can cope with a crisis, it's more likely that you cope with a crisis. Absolutely. You have proven yourself, right? You are positive about things and therefore it worked. So that's already a good sign, I think. I agree, yes. Moving on to your book that you're writing right now, which is also on resilient supply chains, you share what it really takes to build a resilient supply chain. What are the, the secret in the ingredients that you need? So can you maybe also treat us there with a small spoiler of what are like three of the key ind ingredients you need for building a, a resilient supply chain? Yeah, thanks very much. I just handed in the manuscript last week. So I, now I'm curious when it is being published, hopefully not too long. Actually, what I compiled from scientific literature and also from empirical um, is both let's say, success factors that contribute to supp uh, resilient supply chains. There are success... One of the biggest success factors as well is transparency or visibility within the supply chain. That should be there, but now going back to the empirical study, it's not there. There was 80% of the companies have their first suppliers in their supply chain risk management, but only a third of them has the second tier supplier covered by the supply chain risk management. Yeah, visibility is not is quite difficult, but this is one success factor. It's also collaboration. It's also trust. It's also the leadership in a company. How are companies? So it's a company culture that is one of the success factors. But it's of course, it's also the supply chain design. And those 12 success factors are actually 
supported by a lot of different measures, the, the, a lot of different activities that can contribute to increase the level of these success factors. And I guess the idea of that book was to have something that is, on one hand, scientific sound, but on the other hand, it should be directly applicable. So if managers read it, they could say, ah, okay, this is what I have to do. So that's the the aim I'm following. Of course, mm -hmm. if you hand in the manuscript, then you think, ah, I could have written this or that. But I think it's okay. Listening to it. Initial reaction, I really like that you start with visibility and end with design, because obviously design is the hardest to achieve because it takes a long time to change things in supply chain. So probably that's more the final mile where the last mile starts probably with visibility. One thing that, that I always find curious is even if they say they have that tier one in a system doesn't mean they have the right address in the system, right? Because might be that they have the sales address that might be somewhere in the middle of a big city, but the production location is somewhere very remote, maybe even in a different country. And then it's hard to really measure the risk if you don't know where the production is. I find that to be also very curious because the 80% for me sounds very high. Yeah, it sounds high. That And the issue you mentioned is correct. We, for the empirical study, we did some interviews and actually those guys in the interviews they have that in their focus. So they say, mm -hmm. okay, we look on Google Maps. Is there a river close by? What's the geographical and geological situation around the, the plant? So it should be on their radar. Okay, okay. Yeah. good. Yeah. Obviously, you can automate a lot of these discussions of close to a river or not. Anyway, okay. Let's look now from, we already looked a little bit in the future with your book that's coming out and also the study that's coming out, but let's look even further into the future. So what makes you and your student, the students excited about the future of supply chains? On one hand, supply chain management can improve things. They can, they actually are responsible for everyday life because if you go to the next shop, and something is there, you're happy. If something's not there, you're not happy. And we can also contribute to a better world. And this is something that I sometimes feel from my students when they want, when they think about writing their bachelor thesis, their master thesis. What I often hear is, I want to improve the world. And then they focus on sustainability, for example, on resilience, on the other hand. And I love that the vision they have. So this is something where I get inspired from my students. When you're getting older, you're sometimes you're a little bit moaning about this and that. And some, then the students come, they're young, they're dynamic, they're, yeah, motivated, and they inspire me. And that's fantastic. Yeah. And of course, no. what I can add is we have a lot of technology that is, we're in the middle of a development of technology. So we're not at the end at all. And I guess this is really interesting to see what is coming in the future. Yeah, the art of the possible is amazing. I also love that the students are very still passionate about sustainability in supply chain. Rana Plaza is now a long time ago. That was 2013, but it still is in everybody's mind yeah. somehow. And that's good. I, I think that was a pivotal event um, that triggered a lot of things. Like back then, the picture of the earth The blue marble picture was for the whole movement on protecting the planet. Which yeah. So this was our supply chain event for that. Very interesting. Yeah. No, cool. Yeah. I love that, actually, from the bottom of my heart, because I'm a big fan of the sustainability movement myself. Good. So now we come to the, the last question of the day, which always is the hobby question, as people who listen to the podcast know. <laughs> I know you are a passionate runner. Uh. And running is a lot about uh, like supply chain management about get, going fast from A to B. So now I would love to know what is the difference between running and supply chain management? That's a good question, Ulf. I, yeah, I'm still thinking about that. With my background, having recovered from leukemia, I started to run just a few months after I came back after the stem cell transplant. And at that time, speed was not a topic for me. I was just happy to be able to run 3K or 4K. And just 10 days ago, I finished my first half marathon after leukemia. And again, this was not a, a question of how fast am I, just, okay, am I able to do that? 
if you think about supply chain management and you think about processes, you want to shorten the process, you want to be as fast as possible. We think about same day delivery and so on. So it's a lot about speed. Running can be about speed, but for many, it's just about the passion and the, well, freeing the mind, doing something for your body. That was a great answer. I'm very happy with that, actually. Good. I love this. Okay. So, Michael, I really would like to thank you for your openness, but also just for being here today with me on the podcast. So you were an excellent guest. Thank you so much. Thanks to you, Ulf. It was a pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, I remember we met at, in 2015. Air yeah, resilience. Yeah. So that was fantastic. I love your activities. I love your what you're doing. So thanks for being a part of that. Yeah, thank you. Really, I think you're doing God's work, getting the next generation of supply chain management into the funnel. We need every single one. So that's perfect. Okay, so now for everybody that's watching, listening, or however you enjoy this podcast, actually, I wish all of you a great day and bye-bye. Bye. This was Supply Chain Pioneers. Thanks for watching, listening, or however you are enjoying this podcast. You can find Supply Chain Pioneers on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, all other major podcast players, as well as on YouTube at Wolf Talk Supply Chain. Please don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment. See you next time.